Library of Runa has a vast amount of characters, too many for me to count, but a majority of them are lovingly remembered. The cast of colourful morons you grew to adore throughout the game known as the Sephira, the dastardly group of ne'er-do-wells known as the Blue Reverberation, and even the paper cultists, the Index are fan favourites and any PM fan you ask will likely remember each character from these groups. But there's also a lot of other guests who seem to get lost along the way. Like the original musicians of Bremen, for example. A group that I don't see get that much love all that often, despite being pretty fun guys. And also proving that Angela can bleed, but that's not important. My point is that there's a ton of characters in Runa. Some may say too much, but I'd argue it's just the right amount before it gets overabundant. But despite that sentiment I hold, there is some characters that, even if you ask the most die-hard fans of Runa, they would likely not remember they exist. And these are the general invitations. So tonight, let's take a deep dive and remember Library of Ruin as Forgotten Guests. But first, as we know, Project Moon only makes single player games, and despite Limbus having a friend system in place, I've never felt more alone playing their games. If only Hawkeye could just become real and help me do my mirror dungeons. <gasps> this video is sponsored by Anime Dakamakura Pillows. That's right managers, I now own a body pillow. Saying that out loud is something, but if you want to get your own, go to anime.com.com. ADP is an anime based website that offer a vast array of not just body pillows as the name would suggest, but a very large selection of all things anime. From memory foam pillows to massive mouse pads, you can deck your room up with whatever memorabilia from your favourite series that you can find. But not just your room, you can get outfitted with merch yourself. From the honestly sick looking Hayoris for all my common Rider enjoyers out there, to kimonos and even high quality comfortable hoodies. And if you want to get your own custom pillow, you can buy that too. But heads up, you do have to provide the art yourself. Mine was graciously drawn by Yurisa, who has done phenomenal art for the channel before, so thanks for that. But for you, this should just be an excuse to go commission small artists. But seriously, this thing is massive and comfortable as all hell, I slept so well with it. The print quality is stellar and it's just so soft to the touch. The actual cover is slightly smaller than the pillow itself, which gives it a really tight fit and makes sure it won't go anywhere. But even then, it's held on by this really easily concealable zipper, which is a nice touch. And right now, they're doing a massive Christmas sale, and on top of that, you can use my code ADPDINO for 10% off your next order. So you can buy that present for a family member, a friend, or even yourself that no matter how much you say you don't want it, you need it. And even if you somehow miss the Christmas sale, the New Year's sale is right around the corner anyway, so keep an eye out for that too. Other than that, they do weekly free pillow giveaways on their Facebook, so go check them out there as well for a chance to win some free goodies. Lord knows none of us are strangers to gambling around here. So once again, that's code ADPDINO for 10% off your next order. I would hope to see a few more Project Moon body pillows out in the wild now. But for right now, Hakma is all mine, ladies. Get your own, man. So, thanks again to ADP for the sponsor. It means a lot, and now I can finally grind Mirror Dungeons with the support of Surrey and Silius Soldier. Oh, and Faust is there too, but that's not important. Now, back to the video. So we start our amnesiac journey really early on in the game, at the very beginning, in fact, in Cannard. In which, using one book of any type, Cannard or Urban Myth, will invite the Backstreet Butchers from District 23. Not much to say here, except how it sets the extremely endearing dark tone going forward that sticks with you throughout all of early game Runa, and it also softly foreshadows Best Girls Arrival. Two Urban Myth books gets you to hook off as remnants, the ones that you've likely killed by this point. These guys don't have much to say about them, other than their hoodies looking clean. And I do like the idea of using sights or ice picks as weapons though, it's very barbaric. And for one Canard book and two Urban Myth books, you can get the Urban Myth Class Syndicate, which is literally just a mix of the Hook Office Remnants and the D23 Butchers, neat stuff. Then we get to Urban Legend, and for one book of this rank, you can invite new guests. And these are grade 8 fixers. Nothing too out of the ordinary, just your run of the mill mark with some really cool looking iron blades. Then for two books, you can invite a bit more gruff looking grade 7 fixers. I think this gives a little bit of subtle storytelling with the juxtaposition of both the group's designs. Grade 8 is a lower rank, but they look much more professional, with finely done suits and obviously cared for blades. They look like businessmen, not fighters at first glance, but then grade 7 is a higher rank, but they look much more rough and tumble. Their clothes are loose, their weapons look like they were scraped together in a dump, and their posture is much more laxy daisy. They obviously know their way around the block, and they're a lot more street smart despite looking like angsty teens. Maybe I'm reading into it too much? But I do think it helps exacerbate the city's roughness and its killer be killed nature, even if you only subconsciously compare the two. Even this early on in the game, it's kind of foreshadowing how the attitude of guests will be. 
especially in Urban Plague. Using three Urban Legend books gets you the Urban Legend class office, which has a mix of eight and seven fixers in it. And for the last gang, you need the Book of Rain, Book of Mika, and the Book of Olga. These combined invite the Axe Gang, who come from a syndicate that's buddy-buddy with the Hook Office. Fitting. They are a bit of an exception in the city, as the Hook Office Syndicate went on to become an office, as we know. But instead of becoming enemies straight away, they still helped each other out. A very rare camaraderie in the back streets. Their pages actually show a lot of humility to the throwaways, showing that, despite being a syndicate, they still try to do a little good, even if they get persuaded by a wad of dough at every turn. And it goes without saying, but the Axe Gang's designs are sick. They're actually so damn cool. This is the kind of dystopian gang design I love. Using a book of Gyeongmi, Dino, hey that's me, and Zulu, you get the Urban Legend Class Syndicate, which consists of Stray Dogs and the Axe Gang members. Now onto Urban Plague, my personal favourite part of Runa. For one Urban Plague book, you get the reason I wanted to make this video. Jakan. Jakan is so, so, so cool to me as a character, despite of how much of an edgelord that might make me sound like. Let me explain. Jakan is the leader of a syndicate called the Rusted Chains. A group of masochistic psychopaths who wield extremely sharp and spiky chains that wrap around their own arms and dig into their own body, causing insane bleeding on both the attacker and the receiver. Jakan's body is plastered with self-inflicted scares, but he still has a smirk on his face showing that he enjoys this. The Rusted Chainlinks are exactly the backstreet psychos I think of when I think about what makes me love Varuna. These guys don't feel pain, but revel in it, and will gladly put themselves in danger for the thrill of it. The Syndicate members are called the Rusted Chainlinks, which is cute, but they look a lot more metal than Jakan. Limbus has brought back some general invitations as IDs, which we will get to very, very shortly. But of all the guests in Runa, and I mean every guest in Runa, the one I want back most is Jakan. My boy needs new light, and to add a much needed psychopathic edgy reprise into Limbus. I need to see him in the Limbus art style, please, please give me Jakan Faust or Heathcliff PM, pretty please. For two urban playbooks, you can invite the workshop affiliated fixers page. These guys don't have much going on on the surface, but in their page, it mentions how the relationships between workshops and fixers work, and how new weapons need to be approved before they're ready for use in city. But it's not all bad, as the workshops do care about their craft and give constructive criticism on what could be done better. Now, this makes you think a little. We just talked about a bunch of degenerates who use razor blade whips as weapons. What exactly constitutes what is suitable for City. I think this deserves its own video someday, but it's something to think about for now. Also, capes and hoodies don't mix, sorry. For three urban plague books, you can invite the Jong office fixers alongside their leader, Hanafuda. These guys are from J-Corp, and specifically the Nest, and if you remember J-Corp from Limbus, they love to gamble. The fixers page actually mentions the singularity a bit, saying that people rely on a special entity that predicts events. This gives some insight into J-Corp that people gamble their lives away in games almost every day with hundreds of people winning and losing. The Jong office's job is to monitor these games and act almost like referees to verify the results and make sure nothing arises from the situation. But because of the sheer amount of games every single day, the Jong office is usually stretched pretty thin. Design-wise, they're really, really cool with fully black leather coats and Hanafuda's purple linings that really pop with her violet hair. Her page is one of the coolest in the game to put on your own nuggets. As when she attacks, her sword leaves a sick looking purple entrail behind us. Not much else to say for them, but the fact that they set up J-Corp this early and expanded on it in Chapter 2 is really something. And part of why I'm a Kanto 2 apologist. Urban Nightmare doesn't actually have that many general invitations, but it does have two of arguably the most iconic ones. Even if they're not the coolest like Chikan, or he who shall be named later. For one Urban Nightmare book, you can invite Dante and the Seven Association Fixers. The Seven Association are, for lack of a better term, private investigators. They have an encyclopedic knowledge of City in their databanks, but choose not to share it with the public for the quote, safety of this world. Scary. They are one of the coziest and comfiest offices in the city by the seams of it. As in Limbus Company, we see that the Fixers have a very friendly relationship, and even find time to make tea. That's practically luxury living in City. One very interesting tidbit is that in the Seven Association Fixers page, they reference someone who was among their ranks but ran off to join the Musicians of Bremen. And if we go back to Oink's page, we can read that he was in fact part of Seven at some point, and his entire page is a lore dump of how they managed to keep their info secret. And even that they know exactly what district the pianist was in when he distorted, but he couldn't catch the number in time. God damn it, Oink. 
Anyways, he mentions how the entire office fights with simple bladed tools, which we see in their fight, and it's kind of underwhelming, you're right, Oink. But at least the green suits are snazzy. Maybe a shade lighter would be nice, but can't argue with results. For two Urban Nightmare books, you can fight Bamboo Hashed Kim and the Blade Lineage, a group of violence-loving sociopathic samurai LARPers. They love fighting, and I mean love fighting. Kim's page states that people without any scares at all aren't allowed to join their ranks, because they're, quote, doubtlessly too careful when he wields his weapon. These guys are the polar opposite of the Seven's clean and professional way of approaching fights. If you weren't balls to the walls reversal on wake up aggressive, they don't want you. In real life, a very, very popular form of honor is for a samurai to have scares on their front, but none on their back. This is because scars on your back show that you tried to run away, and they become a swordsman's shame as a constant reminder of their escape. However, Blade Lineage believe that if you have scars, then you're not a coward and instead a real warrior who fights rough and dirty. It's a sickly funny twist on a historical taboo that adds a bit more character to Kim, by showing us that, despite being dressed like an honourable looking fighter, he's completely twisted in the head and has no respect for delicacy. Remind you of someone? Yeah, in the Rusted Chainlings page, it shows a conversation between two members. One of them asks how the Blade Lineage are doing, and the other one says their bosses are going to meet up. So, Jakan and Kim are canonically friends? Colleagues? I don't know, but it's really cool that the masochists stick together, and they respect each other enough to look out for one another. Again, compassion is rare in City, but it rears its head in the weirdest of places. The Blade Lineage looks stylish, and I dig their long coats. And I would like more abstract weapons, but I honestly can't think of any better weapon for a samurai larper than a sword. Maybe a gun. Serve the City is the last section of the game with general guests, but it has a lot, so let's get into it. For one Serve the City book, you can invite Dong Quan, the Grade 1 Fixer. This is a solo fight, and you have to fight him mono a mono, making it easily the most fun general invitation, and makes me kind of wish that they experimented a bit more with them, but it makes sense here. His page is juicy. First of all, he mentions how a friend of his, who happens to be a colour, who isn't named in the page, has been hired by Hana Association to go hunt down Blue Reverb and his goons. But as we see later, that didn't quite work out and we now know that he was friends with the Vermilion Cross. He mentions the camp the Blue Reverb had set up outside the library and how they're jumping some syndicates that tried to attack them. But Dong Huan was asked to visit the library by himself and he seems to think it'll be a short job. Wonder where he is now. Dong Huan is a badass. His sword looks slick and he wears his clothes very loosely which shows us that he doesn't take most of his opponents seriously. Like the library for example. The fact that he's friends with the Vermilion Cross probably adds to his arrogance. But for all we know, without the library, Tan Quan could have become a colour himself. He'll be back one day though, that's for damn sure. For one Sarah the City Row 2 book, you can invite Miri Life Insurance and their leader, Irina. It goes without saying, but in such a dangerous setting as the city, everyone wants insurance. And as such, Miri steps in. These guys are sharp, wearing expensive suits and carrying around briefcases as their weapon. They're ready to break your knees and write you a claim all in the same hour. Irene is a much older looking lady to the rest of the guests so far. And for that, she's much cuter, but also much wiser. She's been around the block a few times and her swanky, less serious posture shows that. A running theme with a ton of these guests is that they're not taking the library very seriously, but they get humbled fairly quick. Her page doesn't mention much else except that they use presumably the Seven Association to rat out who are making false claims and who are genuine claims. Which I suppose is a nice bit of world building. For two Sarah the City Row 1 books, you can invite the Night Owls and their leader, Alan, who looks suspiciously like Mirasalt, but we'll let that slide. These guys seem to be a subsidiary of the Thumb, and Alan's page meant to tell their boss is usually pretty rash when it comes to sending them off on missions. One look at Alan, and that's pretty obvious. He's up there for one of my favourite designs in the franchise, because he perfectly encapsulates a much more compliant fixer than Chakan by looks alone. Chakan smiles, is covered in blood and scars, and obviously enjoys this. But Alan is solemn, with a scar on his forehead and a missing arm and leg. The man looks defeated, yet still clean with his slicked back hair and formal suit. He obviously despises his job from his page, but he works anyways because it's a guaranteed payday after it's said and done. These are two sides of a coin that adds so much to City's world building but can be entirely missed by most players due to them being optional fights. His foot soldiers don't seem to be as worse off as Alan, but they still hold the same vitriol for their boss. For two Sarah the City Row 2 books, you can invite the Leaflet Workshop Fixers and their leader Ye. The Leaflet Workshop create weapons and sell them off for reasonable prices to fixers, and much more marked up prices for syndicates. 
They mention membership clubs and stuff, and the fixtures page ends with this cute line that's an obvious nod to the library. Ye is a tech nerd who loves all things mechanical. The only reason they go to the library is to find new technology. They have a very striking steampunk design where it's safe to assume that that's probably their head and not a mask, judging off the pipes running from each end. The fixers wield huge steam-powered hammers, and even their pages utilize a lot of smoke. I guess it was a given we would get steampunk fixers, but we still need cowboys and Limbus, goddammit. I NEED COWBOY FIXERS! For 3 Star of the City Row 1 books, you can invite the Ujat, a grade 1 office who exclusively work for a person called Lady DS, who doesn't come with them to the library. These guys are most definitely cultists, but have a very unique style with their gold and black Egyptian outfits and weird looking swords. Not much is said about them in Runa, but they get expanded on in Distortion Detective. Which I'm not gonna say here, because you gotta go read it yourself, go read Distortion Detective, PLEASE! And the final guests, and one of the coolest, are the Bayer at Office, a group of spear-wielding, sophisticated gents and ladies heralded by the old man himself, Bayard. Bayard looks badass, being a rugged old man with a torn cape over his suit. He wields a giant iron-tipped spear as his main weapon and looks smug of his victory. Bayard's page reads like an old man's experienced ramblings, and it talks about how the office used to be a ragtag bunch of loonies, before a man called Renaud took them in and helped convince Bayard's troops to get a grip. Bayard was jealous of Renaud's leadership skills, but being an honourable man, he kept him around, because he's chill like that. And that's about all the general invitations in Runa. There's not that many, all things considered, but I have to commend Project Moon for adding them regardless, and tons of lore for them to boot. It's really cute to see that characters like Kim and Chakan have history, and even nicer to see places like J-Corp being set up. But it's still pretty annoying that all these characters are optional, despite having so much lore. But it is what it is. Gyas Gyas and Rizzes Riz. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing as it helps a ton. And make sure to check out Anime Dakamakura Pillows with the link in the description. Thanks a ton for the sponsor. Anyways, that's all for now. But we better get Cowboy Fixers soon or I'm rioting.